welcome to part two of our series on veterans. This is your queer story, and I am Evan Jones. And I'm Paul Hobbs, still the better of two hosts. Absolutely um, not. And I think I'm going to run that poll. You think, oh, you're still going to run that poll? <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't do it last week, because I always say I'm going to do things that I know I never do, but I'm going to oh, do it this we time. We are the worst. This is why we need someone else, and we can't find someone else. You know why? Because we, we procrastinate. <laughs> Because we are not good <laughs> at keeping up with things. We've kept up with this podcast. We, the podcast is the only thing we've and kept we up with. And we are working on our other stuff. Uh, we're doing better. We have some videos on our mm-hmm. Patreon. We, we're we slowly getting better. We're trying to be more committed, but we are not. We need someone to keep us in line. And the thing is, we say we're procrastinators, but the truth is we're both really fucking busy. <laughs> That's true, too. Like, we don't, I don't think we're cat- cutting ourselves enough slack because, like, we have a thousand things that we do. Like, I'm just, like, never You work, home. like, 50 hours a week. I've mm-hmm. started, I work overtime. I yeah. work about 50 hours a week now. Um, then and have- then we both are in serious relationships. We have to, yeah. you know, spend time with them um well plus i mean david does drag and that's a business you know his own business and i attend as many of them as i can and go to those which is usually about one a week so that's a whole night for me Mm -hmm. i do a lot of like meetups and stuff in the community for queer individuals um and uh and then which you know we just had our transgender day of remembrance which was was nice and um and uh so i do a lot of meetups and stuff and then we both put time into this business but we do it like you know writing the podcast I spend regular a lot of time, maintenance yeah, editing i work yeah. on the website i update the plugins the scripts i make sure code's running right we're just making so many excuses but we are busy but basically we're not college kids working 10 hours a week exactly that's our point <laughs> our point is we have lives, and we are working to give you better content. Um, so, uh, but thanks for for following us on social media. We put some things out there, and we try to stay in contact with you guys. And we love whenever you communicate with us. So, anytime you want to comment on one of our posts or or send a message or whatever, yeah. One thing we free. never miss on is usually the same day we respond. Yes. If you tweet to us, if you Facebook message us. Yeah. Um, if you comment on our YouTube videos, one of us is going to respond to you within a day. Exactly. That's one thing we never miss. We love yeah. the interaction. So mm-hmm. while we might put certain things off in the back burner, you are number one priority. Communicating with you guys is, is number one. Communicate through Messenger on social media is best. I will say that our our um, Gmail sometimes lags a little bit. <laughs> so if you want to message Evan... <laughs> Facebook. If you want to message Paul, Twitter. I'm also good at, at um, Instagram, although I don't have access to the Your Queer Story Instagram. You can um, message me at EB and J Sandwich on Instagram, and I do uh, reply to those pretty quickly. But, but yeah, because <laughs> someone hasn't given me. But of course, Paul has different passwords for all these things, and I can't remember. That's what because it's I'm making sure we don't get hacked. Okay, fine. Yeah, because everybody, what are they going to do? Still all our queerness? Delete all of our posts. Well, that would be rude. Yeah, exactly. We'll put them back up there. All right. <laughs> but that's why you don't friend request random people. I keep getting, you know, ever since, I will say that ever since, you know, coming out as a transgender man and changing my status on um, Facebook to mail, I get all, I get so many requests now from these like super hot women with like two pictures on their profile. They're bots. And the, huh? I know they're bots, of course. I'm just making sure you were. I don't think that they're, that these women are suddenly so attracted to me. They're like, ooh, I, now I see so, you. So it's a thing because I get requests from women that are like <laughs> extremely like overly skinny and they have like a, yes. like a like massive ass, like, beautiful views, yeah, like boobs. the the American horribly pictured woman like yes. what america thinks women should look like well yes what american media has told yes. us women are supposed to look so like. i get these yeah. friend requests and then i'm like why like i'm, <laughs> I'm like should you be able to like like these exactly. bots are so bad like, they are bad of all the people like i'm probably the least the last but i will say you though to. when I, I always look to see like because they'll, they'll be like friends and they'll have pictures and it's all guys and i'm like how do these guys not know how do they not know. know that you're saying yes to a bot? What do well, they you think know is going to happen? You know what these bots are? What? Um, they are, what it is, is you accept their friend request and they'll have like a link on their page. It's like, watch me live on cam now. Uh-huh. So like if you click on the link, it'll go to like Chatterbait or like some kind of, you know, those like webcam sites where like yeah. girls and guys mm-hmm. go on and they do, um, they'll like jerk off on camera yeah. or whatever. Yeah. That's what they are. So it'll link you there, and if you subscribe, they make. If you like sign up for an account, they make money. Oh. Okay. So it's just like a farm. They make like 
30 Facebook accounts or more, and then they just, like, set it up a bot that, like, automates it. So maybe they're making, you know, 20 bucks a day or something. Okay. Like, so they could be think, making a shit ton of money. Who knows? But, do you think like, the people that are friends with these folks know that it's what no. they're signing up for? Okay. No, because otherwise they wouldn't do it. Or maybe, or maybe they want a subscription to watch someone jerk off. Yeah, I mean, they would do that, but they're not actually getting that person. Yeah. They're signing up to the website. I know, but then, but maybe they know that that's how they get to the website. Or maybe they could just use the website. I don't know. I don't know. You know the worst thing that I ever bought when I was drunk? I think I told you before. A gay porn subscription? Yes. I bought a $30 gay porn (laughs) subscription and completely blackout drunk. No recollection. (laughs) Wasn't until I went to the bank the next day to demand that I have a refund. Someone has fraudulently charged my account. I was so mad. And the woman at the counter was just blushing because she was like, um, I was like, I want to know what this charge is. And she goes, um, well... Um, and then she like tells me the name and it's I like look it anal up. Pounding <laughs> I was like, ah, well, thank you very much for your time. You have a good day. Didn't madam. you say it was your brother? <laughs> yes, I did. I was like, ah, uh, my brother, uh, I think he like stole my card. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I totally Tuck your tail and like run out of the building. <laughs> I bet a $30 monthly subscription to gay porn is amazing though. I wish I had the money to blow on it. <laughs> so. ha, 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 ha. The money to blow on it. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, coming in with the dad jokes, even when they're gay. Yeah, every time. Look at you. Gay dads are a thing. Yeah, I know gay dads are a thing. (laughs) (laughs) I was just saying, gay dad jokes, are they a thing, though? I guess they are. I guess it's double the dad jokes. (laughs) Double the dad jokes. Yeah. There you okay. go. So, uh, <laughs> what did you do this week? Um, I, I did the same thing that I've been doing, which was, um, which was just, I'd say, busy. I had a meetup um, for, just for trans guys in the area, and then um, not much. I wanted to get to the Transgender Day of Remembrance, which was um, November 20th. And a lot of places all around the country did different things, uh, candlelight vigils and services. Unfortunately, I was not able to get to uh, the service because of work. Um, but the, but I do appreciate, at least in our area, we had a couple good things. So I appreciate that. But, um, but yeah, it was just the regular, you know, errands and everything. Um, convincing my fiance to let us put up our Christmas decorations because she's one of those people that thinks that you shouldn't put them up until after Thanksgiving and that is a complete waste of time. No, we started like the day after Halloween. Yeah, exactly, which is what you should do. November 1st, folks. November 1st. But she wouldn't let me put them up November 1st so we've been having, but we're getting them up. No, you have to. Like, the whole point of Christmas is to experience the feeling. Like, it, I love exactly. it. Like, when you're decorating, you put Christmas music on. Yes. And then you just, like, burn pine candles in your house. Yes. And it's just, like, your house is just so, like, you just smile you and you're happy. You have so many weeks to experience it. If you do the day after after Thanksgiving, then you have, like, three and a half weeks, depending on when it falls, for you to, to enjoy it. And, no, that's not enough time. Right. It and then you have to put your decorations up and take them down. So Exactly. Quick. Like and then lot. on the 26th, got to be packing all that up. And I can't be doing that. I'm going to be gone on December 26th, flying back to Indiana. So, more about that to come. But, uh, but yeah, no. No, I, we got... So, we're, we're getting them up. We're getting them up. But, yeah, it's been a hassle. It's, it's hard, folks. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like <laughs> living with someone who doesn't know how to celebrate Christmas. What did you do this weekend? <laughs> so, um, as I'm sure everyone's heard in past episodes, I have a fear of drowning in water because I almost drowned and Evan had to save my life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've reached out to a swimming center, swimming building. I don't know what they're called. There's a, a pool. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a pool though. It's okay. like a whole building, and they have like dedicated swim- to swimming. Yeah. They have, okay. it's like, they have like swimming instructors. They train swim okay. teams there. But I reached out to them. I have some private lessons. So that I can learn to swim. I know how to swim. I just panicked and now I have a fear. So like I just need to get in the water with somebody who can like walk me through like this is how you do a backstroke. Like this is how you tread water. So that'll be exciting. Yeah. That'll get me in the shape for my cruise in February. Nice. Um, And then other than that, um, David's birthday is on the 22nd, Thanksgiving. And so is my sister's. So just planning for that, you know, making dinner reservations, getting presents and that kind of stuff and just staying busy with work, playing lots of video games still. (laughs) There you go. The same old, same old. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Why aren't we doing interesting things? Because it's this time of year. This time of year is too busy. That's right. We don't have time to do interesting things. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we're doing good things. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. 
So, anyways, we're back again with a two-parter on a thank you to our transgender military men, women, and everything in between, everyone in between. Um, and last episode, we talked about the first couple wars, Revolutionary War, um, Civil War, touched a little bit on World War One. There's not a lot of information on queer individuals. We talked surprise, about surprise, 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 surprise. The Baron von, Baron Friedrich von Steuben, an openly gay uh, military man who whipped our um, colonial militias into shape. Yep. And Albert Cashier, a transgender man that served during the Civil War. And now we get to the time where a lot of information starts. To, you know, we have a lot of information on the queer community. Well, around this time, like, there were so many advances in, like, Everything it was just yeah. harder to not acknowledge it because it was recorded on so many different medias and yeah. platforms. Like before, it was like if it wasn't written down, it was just gone forever. Yeah, and now you start seeing different ways of things being, you know, transferred. Yeah, there were yeah, and and publications like it's not that people didn't have access to a lot of books before, but like it was just publishing was becoming more. It was becoming cheaper and easier. And there were just many, there were so many different ways to get your mm-hmm. information. And out things there, like were being connected more. Exactly. It wasn't as like, you had to ride your horse and buggy and exactly. drop your parcel off. And now, we, yeah. Yeah. now we have the phone, we have the telephone, um, you know, people are living closer together. We have automobiles so you can travel. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things are bringing together. And we talked about how there was that, um, while there was kind of, I don't know if it was a tolerance, but it was just like. I guess it was a tolerance of queer individuals where it's just like, you do your own thing. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, it was well, a, we're not going to talk about it, but... Exactly. You exist. Just don't bring it up. I don't want to hear about it. It was kind of like a don't ask, don't tell yeah. without being in place. And then at around World War I, uh, the military decided that they needed to do something about all this... Um, gayness. All this gayness is coming. <laughs> like, how are we going to handle the gays? So Because they need handling. Huh? Because they need handling. Yes, because they need handling. So while there's a lot of... So the white evangelical middle class was not open to tolerance. Uh, As World War II erupted, so did a wave of anti-homosexuality. When Japan bombed bombed Pearl Harbor, men lined up around the corner to sign up for the draft. However, physicians and recruiters were instructed to screen out homosexuals. 5,000 able-bodied men were denied entrance to the military because they were homosexual. But those denied entrance were actually saved a lot of heartache later on. LGBTQ individuals that escaped detection and entered the service would often later face the consequences of a blue discharge. But think about that. 5,000 people who are willing to fight and die for their country. Think about what a difference that could have made mm-hmm. in the in the war. And exactly. like the pace of the war, the... How many people those five thousand people could have saved? Yeah, I mean it's 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 just it's just insane. Like you, do, yeah, they literally turn people away just because, and that's just the start. Right. Yeah. That's just the start, and the end. When you add all together, I mean, there was over at least twenty thousand queer individuals that were turned away, kicked out of the military, and that's just the one. And then there was another twenty thousand. We don't like where it's kind of hazy on whether or not they were. So. Mm-hmm. A lot of people turned away and denied service just because of being gay. So, the Blue Discharge, also known as the Blue Ticket, had been created in 1916 to replace the unclassified discharge. While it was while it had been around for a few decades, it wasn't used often until World War II. So this is where I was saying. So in 1916, so this is still in the middle of World War One. They changed, there was an unclassified discharge, which could be, it was very hazy, and they changed it, but it wasn't originally to specifically targeted at homosexuals. It wasn't until World War II that they start Mm -hmm. using it. So, suddenly, bigoted military commanders had a way to get rid of the homosexuals in their rank. Being gay or queer didn't qualify for a dishonorable discharge, but it could get an LGBT soldier a blue ticket. This often involved a military court-martial and imprisonment. That's right, B. People imprisonment. Imprisonment. Just, yeah, for being gay in the military. Yep. So the consequences continued once the soldier was released. Those given the blue ticket found it hard to find jobs at home since the, dis- since the discharge went on a person's federal record and employers knew the implications behind the blue discharge. In addition, these servicemen and women were denied veteran benefits, which, men- which means that many had no source of income after serving in the greatest war in history. So you're gay... 
you are it's put on your file that everyone mm-hmm. can see that you're gay yeah and you're just fucked because uh, yeah for being gay well the thing about the blue discharge is that it, it there was actually a couple reasons why you could because it was kind of supposed to be in the middle because you had dishonorably discharged that's someone who has done a grave violation mm-hmm. um like i mean you've broken a law like murdered someone right. or you deserted the army or whatever and then you have honorably discharged someone who's just released from the military and so they they had they wanted something in the mil- in the middle that's like okay well we can't put you on the level of murdering someone but we also don't want people to think that you left on good terms right. And there was a couple reasons why you could be, um, you could receive the blue ticket, but everyone just assumed it was gay. It was because you were gay. It was like, this was, it's like kind of like the lavender scare where it was like, if you got fired, um, for, from the state department, you were just assumed to being, um, you were assumed to being gay. If you were called a communist, it was because you were gay, even though you might not be. Can someone tell me why people are so scared of gay people? I I really can't figure it out because (laughs) if you're like terrified that like gay people are coming for you, maybe you have some personal issues that you need to think through because I can't figure out like... What the only people do? that scare me in this country mm-hmm. are the extreme religious white men with guns. I am terrified yeah. of That's it. Which makes sense because they're, they're extreme the... and they have guns. And they've done how <laughs> many mass shootings this year? Exactly. This year alone. And in, in general, the majority of, of mass shootings are done by straight Christian. white men with guns. Christian straight white men with guns. I can't, like, I'm not scared of any other group of people. Exactly. There's no, I, I, I just don't know what they thought the gays were going to do. I mean, they always use the children. They're going to corrupt the children and then the children will be gay. And then what? You know who is yeah. corrupting the children? Probably the priests molesting them yeah. all the time. I keep... I, <laughs> Just saying. Yep. Yep. But hey, no, no, we don't want to talk about that. No, we can't, we can't, <laughs> we can't put that on there. We're sending our kids to be abused and molested by pr- priests and uh, people in churches every single fucking day. But watch out for the gay man. Right. He's a pedophile for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So the Army estimates that at least 5,000 men were served with blue discharges and the Navy estimated 4,000. That's just the Army and Navy. Of course, you then you have the Marines, you have other branches of the military. Bert Garrett, Bert Gerritz, it's G-E-R-R-I-T-S. Bert Gerritz served as a Navy medical corpsman. He was able to keep his identity a secret. However, he was stationed on the psychiatric ward where gay sailors were imprisoned when caught. A psychiatric ward on a boat. That's awful. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. So while Gert... So while Gert... I think it's just Garrett's. Oh, you know what? I think you're right. (laughs) (laughs) How difficult can I make this word? Excuse me. This is my mouth. It never works. It's like with the asexuals, and I was calling everyone asexuals, and then then I finally was like, it's asexual. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I was also calling it saying, everybody needs to go to the fascist rally. And my and Samantha's like, you need to say fascist. You need to say your A's. And I was like, okay, Samantha, you need to calm down. You're from the Chicago area. I don't understand why you have problems with A's. <laughs> I don't know. We all pronounce everything like, eh, 20. Like, it's so like, eh. I don't know. It's, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I think it was British in another life. So Garrett's her. So while Garrett's hurt for the sailors, he was able to form some friendships that later helped introduce him to the gay scene. So he used it as his advantage. So like, I know you're hurting and you're in asylum, but also, where's the guest best gay bar? <laughs> Most soldiers were not as fortunate as Garrett's. Norm Sansom was an army recruit who, had, who was volunteered to help with the drag shows the military put on to entertain the troops. While the servicemen enjoyed a good laugh at the expense of homosexuals, they didn't find it funny when it turned out Norm was actually gay. Who was fucking surprised? <laughs> what the fuck? You know all the drag queens and you can put on a show. You're gay? What? So that's going to be a whole episode in itself one day about how drag like really took off in the military. And they had so many shows. I watched a documentary on this and it blew mm-hmm. my mind because they were so anti-gay, but they're like... Put on a drag show for all the straight army men, but uh, also if you're gay, we're gonna discharge you. Exactly, exactly. If we're gonna get, you're, we're gonna lock you up. We're gonna put you in asylum. You're gonna be dishonorably in discharged. a psychiatric ward on a fucking boat. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, yeah, that'll be a whole episode one day just on the drag shows because because it was World War Two was notorious for its drag mm-hmm. shows. Like, it was used to build morale around the country. Even. Exactly. And, and overseas, like, I mean, that was... And, and it all started really with sexism because women couldn't be in mixed ranks, so they had to have men... So they, mm-hmm. like, they would do the shows, and they loved laughing at a man in a dress. Oh, my God, it's the funniest thing. 
But, um, but yeah, but then, of course, the drag queen ends up being gay, and nobody saw it coming at all. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> Hey Queerstians, do you own a business? Are you an author or an entertainer? And would you like a great way to grow your audience? Well, this commercial slot could be yours. For just $20 a month, we can advertise your show on our podcast. And as a rapidly growing queer content source, we want to help get your name out there. So if you want even more promotion, you can just choose our $30 tier to get ads and links on our website. And for only $40 a month, we'll review your product on our YouTube channel and link it to all of our social media. So go ahead, send an email to your queer story at gmail today or reach out to us on social media via messenger and let us make your business a little more queer bye, bye. he was served with a blue discharge and denied his benefits so not surprisingly african-american soldiers were targeted harder with blue tickets and whether they were actually gay or not didn't seem to matter this was yet another way a racist and bigoted system could target the minorities one black man who escaped the ticket was vincent miles he dropped out of college in 1943 to join the war and served as a medic in the 92nd Infantry, fighting on the battlefronts of Italy and North Africa. The 92nd Infantry was an all-black unit because the military was still segregated at the time. <laughs> David is playing his games again, yeah. I see. <laughs> okay, Monday so, nights, that's his game time. So Miles managed to keep his sexuality a secret and received an honorable discharge. However, the majority of his fellow African Americans were not so lucky. Between 1941 and 1945, over 48,000 blue discharges were issued and over 10,000 were issued to African American soldiers. Even though black troops made up only 6% of the military, they received 22% of the blue discharges issued. I'm sorry, black people are not that gay. Not to say that like they're just not any more gay than anyone else, right. but they're basically saying twenty two percent of you of you being served these discharges are black and like twenty two percent of you, yeah, they're of uh, the twenty two percent of them were. They're trying to say that a higher percentage of yes. African Americans <laughs> are gay are gay, so that they can get them out of the military. Right. And honestly, it's just racist because they don't want to serve them benefits because this is a way because you can't dishonorably tr discharge them. But this is a way that you can discharge them and not serve them benefits. Like, hey, thank you for going and fighting for our country that still makes you sit in the back of the bus. Also, we're going to accuse you of being gay so we don't have to give you right. any benefits. Yep. Yeah. And it's like, n not only is it bullshit that it's a higher percentage, it's bullshit that these thing blue discharges were a thing at all. <laughs> yeah, of it's course. It's like, uh, I don't yeah. like you because you're gay or I don't like you because you're black or I don't like you because whatever. So just get out of the military and you're not getting anything for serving. Yes, Exactly. Uh, but Vincent Miles did manage to get away with, uh, he was a gay man and he managed to get out and he was able to collect his pension. He was one of the few. Um, but, so in October of 1945, the Pittsburgh Carrier, the Pittsburgh Courier, an African-American run newspaper, launched an attack against the Veterans Administration, the VA. They said of the blue discharges, it is a vicious instrument that should not be perpetrated against the American soldier and rebuked the army for allowing prejudiced officers to use it as a means of punishing black soldiers. The courier specifically noted the discrimination faced by homosexual blue tickets, calling them unfortunates of the nation, being preyed upon by the blue discharged. We demand to know why the American army chooses to, chooses to penalize these unfortunates who seem most in need of army benefits and the opportunity to become better citizens under the educational benefits of the GI Bill of Rights. Because it's just a way for more white people to stay in charge and fuck over everybody else. Exactly. So the Pittsburgh rebuke caused a wave of outrage around the nation, especially from minority groups. Blue discharges were discontinued as of July 1st, 1947, and two new headings, General and Undesirable, took their place. Because you can't just get rid of a faulty fucking system. No, 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 no. <laughs> just replace it with something else that's the same exact fucking exactly. thing. Exactly. A general discharge was considered to be under honorable conditions, distinct from an honorable discharge, and an undesirable discharge was under conditions other than honorable, distinct from a dishonorable discharge. So, the, yeah, the, again, they're making like three... The other it's the same thing, but they're just adding different the same things. Thing, yeah. um, at the same time, the Army changed its regulations to ensure that gay and lesbian service members would not qualify for general discharges. Those found guilty of engaging in homosexual conduct still received dishonorable discharges, while those identified as homosexuals did not... Oh, 
those identify as, as homosexuals, but not to have committed any homosexual acts, now received undesirable discharges. So if you if you were caught having sex with someone, you got a dishonorable discharge because that was grounds for it. But if you just said that you were gay and you were never caught or they could never prove that you had engaged in any homosexual acts while you were in the service, then you were given the undesirable discharge. Same thing. <laughs> Same thing, but they could pretend that it was different. Yep. And we don't want to forget and we don't want to forget that these dishonorable discharges applied to women as well. During World War II, over 275,000 women enlisted to fill non-combat roles. Actually, it was more than that. There was millions of... But um, this was specifically in... Um, they were in the military. So there were a lot of women filled clerical positions and such. So the Women's Army Corps, or WAC, was the most common and well-known formation. Attitudes towards lesbian and bisexual women were more lenient... Though there is a story where Eisenhower told female soldier Johnny Phelps to ferret out all the lesbians from whack, to which she replied she would be the first to go, and his assistant then said she would be the next. Eisenhower dropped the command. <laughs> he's like, get all these lesbians out. She's like, okay, well, I guess we're all going, girls. Everybody round up. <laughs> and he's like, uh, uh, okay, well, yeah, yeah. that's all right. He got him later with the lavender scare. Mm-hmm. But though they didn't face the imprisonments and asylums the gay servicemen faced, all women in the military faced the day-to-day discrimination put upon the female sex during this era. In fact, despite their service, those who served in the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, the WASPs, did not receive any benefits or recognition until 1977, 32 years after the war ended. And in fact, many women didn't receive their their pensions at all or ever, And the, but the WASPs were actual like they were... They were, like, part of the Air Force. Mm-hmm. Like, they were just as much as the men, um, and they did not get any of their pensions. Because until. they weren't straight white men. Are you kidding me? Did no, you think anything in this country was going to be benefited? Exactly. Beneficial? Because the, all the extra fighting that you people did, it was really the straight white guy that saved the world. Oh, yeah. I don't are know you if kidding you me? knew that, but he did. The, are you kidding me? The straight white man ended the war. Like, the straight white man is really God. Pretty much. Yeah. Don't know if you've been watching the news. That's why they, uh, <laughs> the straight white men shooting up everyone. Exactly, because we're not listening. Exactly. God's trying to get our attention. So as blue discharges were changed o- over to undesirable discharges, the discrimination against queer individuals intensified. However, LGBTQ Americans would not let that stop them from s- serving their country. In 1965, America dropped their first boots on the ground in Vietnam. A few years later, in 1969, the government began to draft soldiers to fight overseas. One individual drafted was Sylvia Rivera. Just a few months earlier, Sylvia had stood with Marsha P. Johnson at the Stonewall Inn, openly defying the harassment and discrimination of the Greenwich Village police. Sylvia showed up in all her glory, and the draft board was sure they made they had made a mistake. Ah, excuse me, (laughs) ma'am. This this is a man space, ma'am. (laughs) <laughs> I can only imagine how she showed up. <laughs> I'm sure she did. It's like, hello, boys. You've drafted me. Excuse me. And she's got like a like, rainbow flag flying as a cape. <laughs> probably in like some panties, like something really ridiculous. <laughs> High heels she and was all. Cra- she, was, she was something. Yes, yeah, she was. <laughs> um, and they had, after all... Made a mistake. Made a mistake. The draft was only for men. While Sylvia's paperwork still did have her sex, ass- sex assigned at birth labeled as male, the board quickly dismissed her. So, actually, Sylvia caught a break there. So, good, good, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to go to Vietnam. No. She didn't want to go. But she showed up. Hey, props to her for showing up. You know know? who didn't show up? Who? Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was sneaking off somewhere. Sylvia fucking Rivera showed up as a transgender woman in the goddamn 60s. She's like, okay, you want me to go fight? I'll go fight. Donald Trump's sneaking off somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, you keep voting for him and saying that you're a patriot. All right. So other queer Americans went over to the jungles of Vietnam. Leonard Matlevich volunteered for the Air Force and served three tours of duty in Vietnam. What? I'm just laughing at Sylvia. I, I'm like trying to figure out how she showed up. <laughs> Walking in with the purse. Marsh is waiting outside. Hurry up, Sylvia. We Marsh got is outside to smoking a cigarette. I don't know if she smoked, but in my head it makes a funny scene. Probably. It's the 70s. Everybody smoked. <laughs> So, Matlevich uh, served three tours of duty in Vietnam. He later said, I had to prove that I was just as masculine as the next man. I felt Vietnam would do this for me. During his first tour in 1966, Matlevich received the first, his first, uh, received the first Air Force Commendation Medal for attending to wounded comrades during a mortar attack. He eventually won a bronze star and a purple heart. 
Perry Watkins was an African-American drafted in 1968, and he openly admitted he was gay. He even became something of a minor celebrity for his drag shows as Simone, which he performed in enlisted men's clubs. The army dischar discharged him in 1981 based on his admission of homosexuality, homosexuality in 1968. But the courts order him reinstated because Watskin, Watkins had never lied to the army. And then there was Grief Kammermeyer, who joined the army as a nurse in 1961 and served overseas in Vietnam from 1967 to 1968. When she came out publicly as a lesbian in 1989, after 28 years in the military, she was kicked out. But after successfully suing the military, she returned to the she returned to the reserves and retired as a colonel as colonel. a colonel. She retired and retired as a colonel in 1997. You ran through that paragraph. You're trying to get through all those. <laughs> I know there's too many words in there for me. I uh, no, I love it. So the thing with Perry, which we'll talk about him again in a second, because his comes back around. But like, so Perry Watkins, like. He's, he, he, like, they draft him, and he's like, um, just so you know, I'm gay. And they're like, that's okay, we're gonna draft you anyways. And then 20 years later, or, like, 15 years later, they decide that they're gonna dishon dishonorably discharge him. And he's like, uh, no, I told you I was gay. You motherfuckers wanted to send me over to Vietnam anyways. You're gonna be giving me my mm -hmm. pension. And then I love that, like, I don't know, is it Skirthe? It's G-R-E-T-H-E. -E. That's how her name is spelled. But Kamemeyer, um, Colonel Kamemeyer, like is in the military for nearly 30 years and then she's like I'm a lesbian and they're like well I guess we gotta kick you out now <laughs> you know I, we thought you were doing your job great for 28 years turns out we were wrong yeah pretty much so one of the hardest jobs had to go to Tedesio Samora Samora grew up in California's Central Valley during the 50s a Mexican American boy coming to terms with his sexuality unlike many soldiers Ted volunteered for voluntary Ted volunteered for military service. After he returned to the States, Samora was assigned the job of investigating suspected homosexual troops. He said of the ordeal, Having some of those feelings too, and kicking some of those guys out, it was very hard. I disagree with it very much, because I know that it has been going on since the military began. They've always had don't ask, don't tell. So he was, I don't think he had come out, like he hadn't quite come out even to himself yet, yeah. but like he, he was knew. sympathetic. Yeah. You know, that must, because you can't, uh, that's such a hard situation because mm -hmm. he has to protect his job and his livelihood. Yeah, so exactly. he can't just say, well, fuck it. I'm like, he can't just do that to himself and then be kicked out on the streets. Like it, I can only imagine like how hard that must be for someone. Yeah. Exactly. And then, like I said, because he's still questioning himself. I mean, it's hard if you're hiding it. I mean, that, I don't know. But then when you're questioning, and like, mm -hmm. that's got to be very terrifying because you're seeing what's happening. Right. And you're like, like, well, well now I'm really not coming out. Yeah. Fuck right. That. Yeah. What happens if, yeah. So, and it is true, the infamous Don't Ask, Don't Tell had been a military standard since World War II, though not a formal rule. But things started to swing that way when Leonard Maltovich, the Vietnam War hero, openly, openly challenged the military's treatment of queer veterans. The story exploded in the press, and Mal I'm gonna. I'm sorry, but I can't read. And, and, <laughs> you can call him Leonard. Leo. And, and Leonard was even feared was even featured on the cover of Time magazine. Leonard fought to remain in the Air Force after coming out in 1975, and with him in the fight was Perry Watkins, who was drafted despite disclosing his homosexuality on his induction papers. District Court Judge Gerard Gessel ordered Matlovich's reinstatement in 1980 but rather than return matlovich to duty the air force of the air force offered him a cash settlement of 160,000, but which matlovich accepted sorry you, i you could have just said leonard i said call him leonard no i'm i'm laughing because like oh don't come back to work but we're just gonna oh. give you 160,000. oh yeah right yeah like yeah no just we'd rather it's, he's a freaking war hero he has a bronze star he has a purple purple heart like he and his in his review right before he came out they said that he was one of the the best, like one of the high, um, not highest, um, one of the most outstanding officers that they had. Mm -hmm. Like the year before he comes out, they're like, "You are one of the most outstanding officers that he came out, that we have." And he's like, "Okay, by the way, I'm gay." And they're like, "Oh wow, did we say outstanding? We meant we terrible. Met, we meant your you suck, Dick." <laughs> <laughs> so. But it's, it's fucking incredible that you're get how he the guy has proven himself. Mm -hmm. The guy's been proving himself for almost twenty years, and now you're gonna say that he doesn't know how to do his job. Well, what is what is what is what? I Welcome don't know. Welcome to the American military. God, the 
where they have the biggest sticks and the biggest trucks. Mm-hmm. Not really, but they think they do. Yeah. So, the Army tried to discharge Watkins several times until the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit orders, ordered his reinstatement in 1989, and the United States Supreme Court refused to hear the case. The appellate the appellate court however did not rule the military policy unconstitutional in watkins case rather it decided that simple equity mandated that the army could not discharge watkins for homosexuality when it knew of his sexual orientation all along so that just means that it wasn't like the courts were siding with the homosexuals or the lgbtq like movement the court was just saying because he told you he was gay and you um, and you took him in anyways, you can't, right. um, you can't dishonorably you know. discharge, but they weren't like, it wasn't like a victory for the, um, for the gay rights movement because they weren't siding. They weren't saying it's okay to be gay in the military. They were just saying in this particular case, right. We can't do it. So in order to make sure this didn't happen again in 1981, the department of defense issued a new regulation on homosexuality that was, that was designed to stand up to any court challenges by developing uniform and clearly defined regulations. These justifications made homosexual declarations, whether self-applied or by the military, so whether you said you were homosexual or the military said you were, Mm -hmm. and conduct grounds for discharge. The directive stated, Homosexuality is incompatible with military service. The presence in the military environment of persons who engage in homosexual conduct or who, by their statements, demonstrate a prospect demonstrate a propensity to engage in homosexual conduct seriously impairs the accomplishment of the military mission. The presence of such members adversely expects the ability of the armed forces <laughs> to maintain discipline, good order, and morale. <laughs> I'm not done yet, sir. To foster mutual trust and confidence among service members to ensure the integrity of the system of rank and command to facilitate assignment and worldwide deployment of service members who frequently must live and work in clear in close conditions affording minimal privacy to recruit and retain members of the armed forces to maintain <laughs> to maintain and pub, to maintain the public acceptability of military service and to prevent breaches of security I like Thank that you very last much. line <laughs> The last line, and to prevent breaches of security. Mm-hmm. Right. I just, so it's like, we don't want gay people in because we're scared of them because they're going to look at us. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm sorry, buddy, but you're not that interesting. And also, I think the fear is, like, straight men, not all straight men, but a lot of straight men mm-hmm. are disgusting towards women. Yeah. And they're willing to objectify them and catcall them, so they're like, well, I don't want a man doing that to me. Exactly, right. Yeah, it's just fear that what you do, what goes around comes around, mm-hmm. right? Which a majority of the time doesn't happen, but like, like if they're willing to fight for your country, let them fucking fight. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, yeah, I don't get exactly. this whole situation. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand this. I, I, and you know what? A lot of people in the military don't understand it. This is the higher ups. This is um, this is people that make the laws, and this is the people in the very high ranks. Because those on the ground rarely ever have a problem Mm -hmm. they don't care you're there you have their back they don't care right but they don't get to make the calls you know the captains the you know the the people the the sergeants the ones that are there fighting next to you they don't give a fuck who you're fucking how you identify just show up do your job right but the higher up you go the more politics come into play and now it's not about fighting it's about uh it's not about protection dick Exactly. <laughs> so, this directive was met with much backlash from the gay community. However, with Reagan in the office, there wasn't much they could do. Mm. A light of hope seemed to shine during the 1992 presidential campaign in which Clinton ran with the promise to lift the bigoted ban on homosexuals. In fact, gays in the military was quite the political issue during the 19, during 1992. However, Clinton didn't follow through with his promise. Instead, he gave us Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In 1993, the United States Congress passed and President Clinton signed a law instituting the policy commonly referred to as Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or DAD. DAT. DAT. Which allowed gay... That stupid law. (laughs) Oh, that makes sense. Which allowed gay, lesbian, and bisexual people to serve as long as they did not reveal their sexual orientation. Although there were isolated instances in which service personnel met with limited success through lawsuits... 
efforts to ensure efforts to end the ban on openly gay, lesbian, and bisexual people serving either legislatively or through the courts initially proved unsuccessful. There are so many stories, and we're not even getting into them of of how that affected people. Like it was just, it was such a double double standard because you just had to live in fear of what people decided. Right. Right. You had no power over your future. Exactly, and it was like there would be some commanders that didn't care that you were open. So like you would show up. Like, there would be stories of people showing up to parties with their partner, and they're, like, holding hands with their partner, and they're kissing your partner. But as long as your superior doesn't know, you don't actually say, I'm gay, you're fine. Mm -hmm. And then there would be other cases where, like, someone would be super careful, and then another person would turn them in, and this was just a way for the commander to get that person out, to Mm -hmm. discharge that person. So that did not take away the threat of harassment. Even those who were discreet still faced violence. In 1999, Private Barry Winchell went out with his roommate, Justin Fisher, and other soldiers to Nashville's downtown bars. The servicemen ended up at a club, The Connection, which featured transgender performers. There, Winchell met a trans woman showgirl named Calpurnia Adams. Calpurnia Adams. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, Shortly later, the two began to date. Justin Fisher began to spread rumors of of the relationship at Fort Campbell. Winchell then became a target of harassment, which his superiors did little to stop. The harassment continued until July 4th when Winchell and fellow soldier Calvin Glover got into a fight because Barry called Glover a fraud. After Barry kicked Glover's ass, other soldiers taunted Glover for being kicked by a fucking faggot. Am I saying that? Yeah. I said it. That's what he said. They called him... They, they taunted Glover because he had his ass kicked by a fucking faggot. Sorry, trigger warning. Too late. Um, uh, in the early hours of July 5th, 1999, Glover took a baseball bat from Fisher's locker and struck Winchell in the head as he slept on a cot outside. Barry died of massive head injuries on July 6th at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. After his death, the Pentagon added, Don't harass to the don't ask, don't tell. Glover was later convicted of Winchell's murder and is serving a life sentence. So, sorry for... That was a little choppy. Yeah. But... One thing I want to point out is you see violence rise as more and more anti-LGBT things are being put in place. You don't hear reports from the Civil War or World War One about, like, mm-hmm. people being attacked and killed for being gay. Yeah. Once the government starts getting involved and you get these people in power and religious people saying how bad gay people are that's when the violence starts oh yeah and it, and it just evolves like i mean first of all it's just so ridiculous so so uh barry winchell is dating a woman she happens to be trans it's nobody's fucking business mm-hmm. but she happens to be trans someone and th- and that just shows the ignorance uh and the ignorance and stupidity stupidity so now he's a joke mm-hmm. because he's dating he he is dating a trans woman so a woman that he is attracted to that he likes and she's trans so now and uh now you know he's a He's a bad word. <laughs> and um, and he gets in a fight with this guy, which his roommate, I didn't put it in there, but his roommate, Justin Fisher, who is really the instigator in all of this, and he actually served 12 years in prison for it because he fucking Good. showed up. Because first of all, he spread, it th- he spread the rumors. He started the harassment. And then whenever Glover and um, Barry got into a fight, he started taunting. He was the one who first started taunting mm-hmm. Dro- Glover, saying, oh, wow, you're going to let a, a, a freaking uh, fairy, to be nice, a freaking fairy kick your ass. And uh, and so then that prompts Glover to then go in and beat the guy to yes, death. Yes, to in defend his, sleep. his masculinity. Oh yeah, by right. beating someone in their fucking sleep. You can't even fight him when he's awake. Exactly right. Yeah, while well, you're real tough, go fuck yourself. You know what? You're in prison. You're getting fucked. Playing. I was gonna say he probably is. <laughs> so, so anyways, and the whole result of that was they were, they were also like, oh, asterisk. Don't harass people either. That always works, by the way. <laughs> Just like every time Trump gets up and he's like, I don't like when people uh, people are violent on account of me. Also, make sure that you punch people because I like when people punch at the rallies. <laughs> yeah, literally. <Right>. No. <laughs> so service members discharged under debt continue to seek redress through the courts without success. Courts often cited the Supreme Court's 1986 decision in Bowers v. Hardwick, which upheld the constitutionality, which upheld the constitutionality, it sounds like I made that word up. Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) Um, Which upheld the constitutionality of state sodomy laws. After the Supreme Court reversed Bowers in Lawrence v. Texas, 2003, the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces ruled that the Lawrence v. Texas decision applied to Article 125 of the Uniform 
Code of Military Justice, which banned all acts of sodomy. In both United States v. Steyerwalt and United States v. Markham, the court found Article 125 constitutional, but ruled that the conduct falls within the liberty and trust identified by the Supreme Court, but also said that despite the application of Lawrence to the military, Article 125 could still be upheld in cases where there are factors unique to the military environment that, wouldn't pla that would place the conduct outside any protected liberty and trust recognized in Lawrence. Sorry, a lot of, lot of legal jargon. Just this is what all led up. <laughs> <laughs> Such as fraternization, public sexual behavior, or anything that would adversely affect good order and discipline. Convictions for, cons convictions for consensual sodomy had been overturned in military courts under the Lawrence in United States v. Minnow and United States v. Bullock. In the course of reviewing the end of that, the Department of Defense's comprehensive Comprehensive Review Working Group recommended repealing or amending Article 125 to eliminate any ban on consensual sodomy between adults. So basically these were all... Sorry, <sighs> thank you, Paul, for that. These were all the many court cases that were at bringing about just to say, like, this... And they're all ruling on whether sodomy, like, they go from, like, okay, well, sodomy's long. Okay, well, it has to be consensual. All right, well consensual sodomy we're not sure about all right well it has to be consensual sodomy so there it's all these all these other little laws had to be repealed in order for this one big thing to be repealed and i don't think that people realize that a lot like th these court battles that folks are going into for all these like folks are like how could they take that that baker to court for not making that bake cake because for not making that cake for their gay wedding because if you don't do that little that that so-called little battle all these other things don't trickle don't trickle down and then we don't have rights because nobody ever took the gay the the christian baker to court for not making the bake for not making the gay cake so my whole point with this is there's a lot of there was a, like for years for the next 15 years people were suing different people in the military were suing the american government for their rights just to be recognized by the military that they're fucking serving in and the country that they're serving mm -hmm. you know and they're just they're asking for the same rights to be like hey you know we're gay just let us fucking say we're gay right you know so an attempt to repeal DAT began in May 2010 when the House approved an amendment to the 2011 National Defense Authorization Act. It failed in September when Senator John McCain led a successful filibuster against it, which, rest your soul, John McCain, you know, he was a good man, disagreed on stuff. His daughter's gay, right? I, I don't know. Pretty positive his daughter's gay. You know what, gay. though? I, I appreciate John McCain, but... Mm -hmm. He was like one of the he was like the deciding factor in healthcare. Mm -hmm. But the only reason he fucking voted for it was because he got brain cancer. You think so? I 100% think so. I think if he hadn't got that, he had been like that's not my problem, but then he got it and he realized like people need this to fucking yeah. like save their lives. I'm, I yeah. I really don't think he would have voted in favor of it if he didn't get brain cancer. But he went through so much before, like being tortured and all his medical issues before. I don't know. I'm very surprised by, by John McCain. Although I watched a really good documentary on him. Vice did have a documentary on him, which I would suggest people look. It was on Amazon, um, so you'd have to go on. Or uh, HBO actually did it. But um, And it was really good. I mean, the man, he really was an incredible man. He really, really loved his country. But, he, you know, there was just a lot of things we disagreed on. I don't understand why he was so strict on his social. Like, everything else I get while he was conser conservative. I don't understand his conservative stance on social and issues. And he was just an old white man. That's that's probably it. Um, so, in December of 2010, after a second Senate filibuster, Senators Joe Lieberman and Susan Collin introduced the Don't Act, Don't Tell Repeal Act. It passed the House of Representatives on December 15th and the Senate on December 18th by a vote of 65 to 31. So they had to do this twice, mm -hmm. um, like just because people were trying not to let it pass. President Barack Obama signed the bill on December 22nd, 2010, 17 years after debt had been signed into law by Clinton. So despite the end of debt on September 20th, 2011, the same sex spouses of gay and lesbian service members were not treated on par with the different sex spouses of military service members because of restrictions imposed by Section 3 of the Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA. 
<laughs> and certain federal, federal statutes that contained definitions of marriage that excluded same-sex couples, same-sex spouses were denied death benefits, identification cards, base access, access to repatriation ceremonies, and other entitlements. This continued until same-sex marriage was federally legalized in 2015. Yeah, so you couldn't even, like, go on the base to see your partner. So even though, like, okay, we, will, we won't have Dill Nest, don't tell, you couldn't go, like, you couldn't mm-hmm. live on base with your partner. Like, you couldn't do the things that partners could do. So for everybody, like, well, I don't understand what the big deal about marriage is. Why does everybody want to get married? Because it comes with a fucking million benefits from the exactly. fucking government. Yeah, if you're going to have all these benefits for married people, then you got to fucking be married. You don't want that, then don't have all these benefits for married people. <laughs> God. <laughs> So following the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, approximately 114,000 service members who had been separated from military service since World War II under the categories other than honorable discharge, general, general discharge, or dishonorable discharge became eligible to have their discharges amended. So let's see, that was in 2010. So they only had to wait 70 years to get their, their benefits. But they're coming. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. After the government somehow <laughs> manages to process all 114,000. Exactly. That's when you can apply alive? for it. I don't even know. There's not that many World War II veterans still alive. Exactly. So, that, <laughs> so now you can apply to have them review your case if you want to do that. <laughs> um, so, but that is our episode today. And that another, our final, um, not final, but uh, thank you again to our veterans um, who have served. Thank you. You are braver than I. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate you fighting to defend us and allow us to live how we want to live. Yeah. And again, remember that there are at least 15,000 transgender troops that are currently serving an administration that is fighting to erase them federally. Um, and is fighting desperately to kick them out of the military. Trump has come out and said, he has said that he was kicking them out of the military, but because he doesn't know how the fucking legal system works. <laughs> he has no idea how He hasn't been works. able to do that yet. But if he does figure out how to work the legal system, he will be kicking out um, military, you know, people in the military. They're already serving. They're out there. They're the ones that want to be serving. Let them fucking serve. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so thank you to those and... and um, those who have served despite this discrimination, people of color, women, um, queer individuals, and the transgender soldiers still fighting. Um, your recommended resource for today is Coming Out Under Fire by Alan Bierbe. It's B-E. Beru. No, because there's a little, I didn't put it because I don't know how Berube. to put it. Berub. That's probably it. It's got the little um, dot on the front top of the E. Whatever. B E R. UBE coming out under fire um, and that talks about uh, coming out during World War II it's uh, about about veterans of World War II and um, we also want to un, um, a lot of our information from this episode and the last episode was from glbthistory.org slash outranks um, so and you should also check that out if you're a veteran if you just want to know more about queer veterans and um, I guess that's about it yeah, um, yeah. So, So, uh, stay queer. Don't get a lobotomy. You succulent sapphists. We love you, our little allied hookers, and thank you to our queer veterans. Goodbye. Bye.